October 23rd, 2007. I'm out to find Canada on a map. It used to be there so big and pink, a disproportionately large heart beating against the curves of a sleeping giant. But the heartbeat is barely audible now and so erratic. It comes and goes and no one seems to take notice. After 25 years of working internationally, I can't accept what is happening to this country. Canada's position and credibility on the global stage is withering. While we still enjoy some goodwill based on our military peacekeeping and diplomatic contributions, overall our currency is losing value. I don't want to pine for past glories or wallow in our apparent decline. I want to chart a new course for Canada, to create a new story, a new narrative for Canada based on who we are now as a country, not who we were 50 years ago. Canada's World is a three-year citizens dialogue that aims at engaging untraditional voices in Canadian foreign policy. December 3rd, 2007. So many people have been asking me how we started Canada's World. Well, it was simple, really. We talked to people, lots and lots of people from across the country. In my first weeks, I interviewed over 200 people, and we hosted 14 face-to-face -face roundtable discussions, and we tried a Facebook dialogue. We asked people what they thought of Canada's international position, and we asked them to identify the new realities facing Canada in the world. Those conversations helped us to shape and design Canada's world, and provided us with our dialogue themes and eight principles for moving forward. In Canada, we don't have many public spaces where we come together as citizens. Places where people of different backgrounds mix. We also don't have media that we all watch or read or heroes we can all relate to. Our lives have become very fragmented and disconnected from one another. At Canada's World, we knew if we wanted to develop a new narrative for Canada and the world, we had to overcome that fragmentation and create spaces where people from across the country from different walks of life, different cultural backgrounds, generations, faith traditions, and political perspectives could come together as equals to learn, discuss, and deliberate. I'm very much of the view that foreign policy is not about experts, diplomats, and corporate CEOs deciding together in Davos what the future of the world should be. If it's going to be a real foreign policy, it has to be tied to your domestic priorities and it has to be tied to what values we share as a country. And those values are not just to be expressed by uh, white guys over 50. It's got to be a broader expression that reflects the community as a whole. And one of the great things about this particular project is that it reached out and sought to involve a whole new generation in foreign policy development and ideas and aspirations to set a higher standard for people in politics and in foreign policy and to talk about a changing of the guard both intellectually and in terms of uh, generations themselves. La politique étrangère dans un état c'est c'est presque toujours euh, euh, des décisions qui sont prises au sommet euh, avec assez peu de consultations parfois les parlementaires mais euh, c'est l'affaire du ministre du premier ministre ça se passe souvent en secret et les citoyens apprennent ce qui se passe en politique étrangère en écoutant les nouvelles. Alors que le processus de Canada Monde, de panel, de discussion en profondeur, permet d'avoir une idée de ce qu'un public informé dit « bon, ben maintenant que je suis mieux informé, voici ce que je pense qu'on devrait faire, voici ce que je pense de ce qu'on fait ». Et puis ça permet de voir quelles sont les valeurs principales que le, les citoyens canadiens et québécois aimeraient voir portées par l'État. Et là, voir le décalage qu'il y a entre la politique étrangère réelle et la politique étrangère souhaitée. relationship to Pier 21. So figure out where you fit on that line. Pelagonians are going to be coming over here. It's going to get really quaint. We have people from all over the world in our country. And unlike 100 years ago or 125 years ago when the uh, government of the time invited Eastern Europeans to come and fill up the vast expanse of the Canadian West and basically told people, you know, fit in. And then those people really lost connection with home. Well, today, given globalization, 
of commerce of people, the mobility of people and so on, and advanced technology, people are, are connected to home instantly. And so you realize there's all this energy, all this knowledge, they know the language, they know the culture. When it comes then to uh, foreign aid or, or trying to help other parts of the world uh, solve their problems, we have a natural resource here, motivated, well-educated, and who are defining their being good Canadian citizens as being citizens of the world. So many Canadians are, as Canada's world has put it, globally connected, and what does that mean? Tapping into these globally connected Canadians as a way of informing the kind of work, not only in terms of our foreign policy, but in terms of the international work that Canada does. I think that's incredibly important. So it wasn't just the old debate, the old dichotomy is, you know, foreign policy is about, uh, you know, interests, it's about power, oh no, you know, foreign policies, no, it's about values. This coming together of we have interests, we have values, and we have assets. And in order for us to be holistic and to think in a more innovative way, we need to bring those three together. Great, Dolly, that's perfect. That's why a debate is often when you don't agree, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm going to find out how I can convince you of my position. And a dialogue is much more about finding the center in an argument. Anything else on debate and dialogue? The difference between dialogue and debate, as Canada's world defines it, is a very important nuance. What is meant by a dialogue is a deliberate attempt at tearing away parts of hierarchical structures that divide people on the basis of their work, on the basis of putting one experience over and above another. If Canadian citizens in general are going to have a say in foreign policy, they need to know that anybody, regardless of what you do or what you don't do, has a, as much a right to weigh in on foreign policy as anyone else. I've heard a lot of government and Austin government and us. Government is us. Yeah. That's okay. So to, when you get in caught up in this and this, mm -hmm. you create point. a barrier that really does not need to exist. So together, we can do these things. Right. One of the stellar strengths of Canada's world was its non-partisan approach. It really did not come from any particular political party or persuasion. It involved people from all different political perspectives. And it allowed us to take a look at foreign policy as Canadians rather than as liberals or conservatives or NDPers or any particular dogma. Le projet a été vraiment une réussite euh, dans son objectif premier d'aller chercher la population canadienne à tous les niveaux, de tous les âges, de partout dans le pays. Et donc quelque part, le Canada, malgré son multiculturalisme, le fait qu'on vient de partout dans le monde, je suis moi-même une immigrante, etc. Ce n'est pas le Canada si on n'inclut pas de manière systématique et sérieuse les Québécois et le Québec, les euh, Premières Nations et les autres communautés. Et je pense que c'est une erreur de penser seulement euh, français, anglais. Je pense qu'il y a de plus en plus d'importants blocs régionaux et qu'il faut être capable vraiment de leur donner à tous une voix. So one of the biggest influences for Canada's world from the start was the emergence of the open source and creative commons community. And really this movement is about transparency and about making things democratic. So opening your information up to the public and really allowing regular citizens to be a part of your process. February 3rd, 2008. Tomorrow we release our Canada's World Poll. I've enjoyed working with Michael Adams and Enver Onyx on this opinion research. It's great that the CBC, the Globe and Mail and Le Devoir have come in as partners and the Simon Foundation came in as our major funder. Although I'm wishing that we'd postpone the release until after Super Tuesday, it's hard to compete with the likes of Barack Obama. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that we actually looked at Canada's engagement with the rest of the world on the basis of how are all of us engaging with the world. 
We tried to gauge the quality, the depth, the frequency, and the meaning of that engagement with the rest of the world, both in terms of family connection, cultural connection, commercial connections, and so on. When we calculated, on the basis of our survey, the amount of remittances to family, contributions to NGOs and other organizations, when you add up Canadians' engagement with the rest of the world, you were looking at something well over $20 billion. Well, that's six times or more what we officially are, as a country, spending on improving things in the rest of the world. We've moved from the era of just deferring to government to express our values to us expressing our own values. February 14, 2008. I'm spending Valentine's Day in Calgary. This is the first of eight deliberative dialogues to take place from coast to coast. Two will be in French, six in English, each with 30 participants and each lasting two and a half days. So much has gone into preparing for these sessions. The dialogue handbook, the nine discussion guides, setting up the website, hiring the facilitators, designing the process, compiling the facilitator's scripts, setting up the logistics, briefing the note takers, and recruiting the participants. Thank God for Mary Pat McKinnon and Elodie Jacquet. They're like a well-oiled engine. Alors le processus d'un dialogue régional, euh, pas par pas, c'est euh, d'abord euh, un processus de recrutement, donc plusieurs euh, heures, voire plusieurs semaines de recrutement à l'avance pour obtenir un panel de gens de tous bords, de tous âges, de toutes origines. We really wanted this to be a reflection of the diversity of the Canadian population. So we used a method called random digit dialing, which is basically the same method used for a public opinion research. When you're actually approaching them to participate in a dialogue, sometimes people might feel that they don't really have anything to contribute, often because they don't think they know very much about the issue. It's really important to communicate, especially to citizens, that what we're really trying to uncover is the values behind the issues in question. All citizens have values to bring to the table. And they also all have life experiences to bring to the table. The dialogue over two and a half days took people through a process of learning, generating ideas, rethinking, coming to sort of some sense of individual reflection and then group reflection and then re-reflection in light of what they've heard from their, you know, fellow participants, and then trying to sort of make sense of it by landing on kind of the policy directions that they think Canada should be moving in. It is not someone talking at you. It's not an expert telling you this is how it is or this is my, what I think and that's how it should be done. Uh, actually, your opinion is very much uh, sought after. Most of the forums and sessions where I've attended, people tend to be careful or afraid of expressing themselves. But each Canada World Forum or session I attended, that's one of the first things they tell us. So be free, feel free to express yourself. Dans la plupart des activités, euh, soit dont j'ai entendu parler ou que j'ai moi-même vu, il y avait des vieux et des jeunes, des universitaires, des non-universitaires, euh, des personnes de milieux très différents, mais qui avaient toutes envie de participer et de se faire entendre. Et être capable de les mettre ensemble et d'avoir des dialogues assez profonds entre ces personnes-là, sans qu'il n'y ait nécessairement un sentiment que certains groupes dominent parce qu'ils en savent plus ou bien parce qu'ils sont euh, mieux articulés, plus capables d'exprimer leur position, ça, je trouve que ça a été très très bien, ça a été une belle réussite. À la fin du dialogue, il faut aussi faire un rapport qu'on leur envoie, leur demander leur feedback quand c'est possible et puis souvent les solliciter à nouveau pour la suite du projet, pour d'autres dialogues ou simplement leur demander d'organiser leur propre dialogue dans leur communauté. You have to be systematic about how you can report back to the citizens that participated, the people that you're trying to have the conversations with, the decision makers, people in civil society, the business community, government. And you can't do that unless you're able to accurately capture, record, analyze, and then, you know, give back in accessible reports. Whatever is being said by each one of these people uh, is actually written down by them and stuck on the board. It's like a sort of interactive brainstorming session where you just stick stuff up on the wall. The facilitator will go through it with you and sort of 
bring it together under these like sort of categories so you're seeing the report writing taking place and you're a part of it. C'est très subjectif ce que les gens peuvent dire. Donc en fait, ma formation scientifique m'a permis de prendre du recul par rapport à ça et de vraiment comptabiliser mot par mot ce que les gens avaient dit, de catégoriser en quelque sorte leurs propos et de réussir à tirer de ces propos euh, une analyse quantifiable de, des propositions qu'ils avaient à faire. When you read that uh, record on the website or anywhere else, you say yes, I remember that sentence and it was actually stated by that guy who comes from Ghana who happened to be sitting uh, at the table with me. In other words, it's not something that Shauna said, it's not something that some big shot said, no, it's the people there. So far, the project has received some good media attention, over 100 print and broadcast stories. We're noticing the media environment change, though. More of our younger audiences are looking to blogs and online sources for their information. I've even seen my own habits change as I move from my morning paper to checking out the headlines online and searching for commentary from my favorite bloggers. I recognize how difficult it will be to project what we're doing through such a fragmented media environment. It means Canada's world will need to step up on our online engagement. We used a full range of online tools, most of them available for free or for cheap. We've always tried to be at the forefront of using whatever new tools come out. We had a multi-author blog that was a really big success for us. We were looking for bloggers, people who wanted to come and blog about different foreign policy issues from a non-expert perspective. It exceeded my expectations in terms of the quality of the posts the quality of the conversation that the bloggers were having in the comment section. There's really a sense that they created a little community there. On our website is a really rich variety of materials. We've put all of our different dialogue handbooks online. People were able to post comments in discussion forums. We have a citizen's timeline that's basically a history of Canada as citizens see it and anyone can go to that timeline on our website and upload to the wiki what they think is important in history. We had a very lively Facebook group where there was a conversation going on about lots of different subjects. We have a Twitter group that's really active, we have a lot of followers, and we really like to engage with people on Twitter because that's kind of the next generation of you know, online dialogue. This sort of connection to the digital age that the, the project had it was a really, really neat way of engaging people with, of course, no cost and uh, a diversity of Canadians across the country. I don't think that there is a word or phrase we heard that wasn't examined. And while there is a clear narrative that has emerged from all this work, it's hard to put it down in writing. I'm meeting with Daniel Savas of Ipsis Reid today to go over all the research. He's going to make sure that whatever we compile is consistent with what we heard from Canadians. The pressure is on now because the narrative has to go to translation and printing before we present it on January 30th in Ottawa at our National Dialogue. So much work has gone into this that I'm a little nervous about handing it over to a group of 35 Canadians, some of whom were part of our original random sample and others who were not part of this process. What if the narrative that 4,000 Canadians have helped to shape doesn't resonate? What if they throw it out and start all over again? I would imagine like receiving a very large pile of papers and it was your job to kind of read through the entire thing and try to create a summary of it and that's essentially what the National Dialogue was. The National Dialogues was taking the work that had been done in the Regional Dialogues and trying to coalesce it into some core themes that could get used to help to generate a vision in terms of how Canadians saw what Canada's role in the world should be. The National Dialogue brought together people of, of, of all different backgrounds from all across Canada, all different professions and fields. I think I was one of two people in the 60s. And everybody else was kind of teenagers or people who were about 30 or 25. So I, at first I thought maybe it won't work out. However, to my great surprise, it worked out very well. Beaucoup de points de vue différents sur un sujet et tous ces gens ont pu s'asseoir et expliquer pourquoi je pense comme ça et voilà d'où je viens et voilà mon expérience qui m'amène à penser comme ça et l'autre personne en face a pu débattre 
de l'opposé de ce point de vue-là, mais avec un respect. The fact that we were all able to share such close intimate feelings and passions and emotions, it definitely created a bond. But at the end, I think that we were all just very proud of what we had achieved together. We sat on top of all this information and finally all these people were able to come together and say, okay, I think these are the themes that we see coming out of this. And how is it that we can now take this and condense it in a form that we can hand it to somebody? I was working as a note taker in some of the dialogue groups, which really made me listen very closely to what people were saying because I had to transcribe everything. Having these really active discussions that would just go in directions that I would not have predicted was amazing, especially as a student of political science. It was really interesting to see some theoretical principles just like come to life. April 6, 2009. We're on our second print run of Back on the Map, the report from our National Dialogue. We've decided that it isn't enough to advance a new vision through the report in our PowerPoint presentation. While it might work for government officials and policy wonks, it's boring for some of our younger audiences. Participants of the Women Thought Leaders Dialogue suggested that we should put together a short video that uses metaphor to describe the vision. One of our interns from Korea has put together a stopgap animation that describes the vision as a tree. It's sweet, but we need another type of video to reach YouTube audiences. The staff have hired Giant Ant Media, a great local company, to create a short animated video. So the process of trying to take our two years of dialogue and consultation and turn it into a video was a really complicated one, but a really incredible one. That was the point in the project at which we realized that we really wanted to focus on successes and make people feel more optimistic about Canada's role in the world. So while they work on the script, I'm going to be packing my bags for yet another trek to Ottawa to meet with government officials. I think this is round three of meetings with each of the political parties, members of the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and the government departments that work internationally. One of the dilemmas of the work with, in dialogue, particularly citizen dialogue, is what I call the translation of the results of citizen dialogues into language that policymakers and decision makers understand. Early on, Canada's world made a choice. Uh, I think it probably was the right choice, but it, it meant that challenge was hard, and that choice was that it was a citizen-led process. The framing of the issues and things weren't necessarily the way government might have framed them in order to be able to fit it into their policy-making process. So that, that dilemma of translation of results, if you like, was probably bigger than it might have been if it had been a government-led or had government as a key partner. On the media front, we continue to get a few calls, but I don't think we've really penetrated mainstream media. We're definitely seeing a pickup, though, from online sources. I came in right around the time when Back on the Map was about to be launched. So I did the press releases and I was contacting media to try and get the story of the report out just because it was the culmination of a lot of work from Canada's world. Overall, we've really tried to be a part of the media and get them interested in our process. The buzz from the National Dialogue continues. We're getting so many requests to speak and do workshops. The staff of Canada's World crisscrossed the country on several occasions to meet with small and large groups of Canadians. In total, we were involved in over 150 events, and that's not counting the kitchen roundtables that others self-organized in their own communities. September 28, 2009. I'm in Calgary and it is cold. I've just met with two of our interns. The semester we have 13 interns working in universities across the country and everyone seems to be working on foreign policy camp. The Montreal, Toronto and Edmonton interns are organizing satellite camps on various global issues to the big camp that we're organizing in Vancouver on November 30th. I'm feeling a little nervous about the camp format because you just can't predict how it will unfold but young people seem to like it. It's already generating quite a buzz. Well, no one can tell us that we don't walk the talk. Canada's world has been calling for a new way of engaging citizens and the foreign policy camp is demonstrating a much more open and transparent form of engagement. But I wish I wasn't such a Luddite. Each time one of our staff or interns talked to me about a new online tool, I just kind of nod my head. What exactly is a mashboard anyway? 
I suggested that Canada's World Dual Foreign Policy Camp because I'd been involved with a few camps before. The idea behind a camp is that there's very little preset agenda and lots of opportunity for participants to come in and say, this is what we want to talk about today, this is what we want to do, and let's, let's collaboratively figure this out together. And because Canada's world was so much about emphasizing citizen participation and openness and citizen decision making, it was just such a perfect fit. I remember us staying up really late the night before and crazily planning last minute things and thinking the whole time, what if no one shows up? <laughs> and on the day of, it was, it was packed. Going down just before it started, you know, hundreds of people in the room, all full of energy and excited. But the most notable thing was how many of them were young. The range of people, the socioeconomic range, the age range, the gender diversity, the ethnocultural diversity was terrific. I saw people who were obviously unsure of what to expect of a certain older generation sitting next to somebody who looked like they were from high school. And suddenly you hand out these boom whackers and everybody's wondering what's going on. I have to admit that I was very reluctant to embrace the whole camp idea at the beginning because I, I couldn't understand you know, what you're going to have 400 people come and you're not going to have a, an agenda and it's just going to kind of throw people in and it'll be decided on the spot. As the time went by and I got to know the people and became a little more comfortable and saw the value in the process, I'd like to think that I embraced it uh, wholeheartedly. There was a tone that was set that made, uh, I think, a lot of people who often wouldn't want to speak in those kinds of forums, feel comfortable doing that, and feel comfortable doing that in a way that was meaningful and that actually added to the discussion. Well, that Afghanistan roundtable was really something else. The pretty genuinely eclectic group of people Canada's World was able to bring together into that boardroom and sort of render titles, not irrelevant, people knew who was with who and stuff, but rendered them less important. The Asia Pacific Foundation organized the Asia Pacific Foreign Policy Case Study. It's almost unprecedented to have that kind of sustained dialogue for, you know, a couple hours with such a mixed bag of people talking about the unifying question, how do we get Asia on the mental map of Canadians? The new media component of it was really a defining feature. We use Ustream, live video streaming. We used live wikis for note taking. We had a Twitter hashtag that everyone was using to engage with the camp, even people that weren't there. All of our photos were being uploaded to our Flickr pool immediately so people could see different photos as they were happening. We got people from all over Canada to write on these little pieces of paper what their most important foreign policy concern was. And we got a lot of different answers that were really interesting. And there was also a survey on Canada's role and leadership in the world in various regards. We had graphic facilitators that were facilitating through art all of the results of our online citizen survey. My company, Mergenta, created a software application that we call Mashboard. The survey results were presented on the Mashboard, the Twitter uh, comments were presented on the Mashboard, and those discussions were amalgamated into one single place and then graphically represented to show what the cumulative conversation was. The whole concept behind mixing the experts and the non-experts, bringing up your own topics. Once again, the theme of Canada's world gave voice to people who probably wouldn't have talked in the first place. The closing ceremonies at Foreign Policy Camp when we were all up on stage, there was a kind of a sense of, yeah, we did it. January 27, 2010. Another week, another series of meetings in Ottawa. We've now met with each of the political parties four times, hosted over a dozen presentations to government departments, and briefed most of the members of the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs. Our goal? Be sure that the views of Canadians are communicated to the people who hold the pen in Ottawa. We've had some traction, but citizen engagement doesn't seem to be a priority for the current administration. We've received some excellent feedback on our YouTube video. Over 10,000 people have viewed it through public screenings or online. I wonder how many of them will recognize the central message of the new vision, that Canada should lead by example. 
I'm still amazed at what this process has created. Can you imagine what Canada's role in the world would be if we focused our efforts on advancing a green economy, fostering innovation, promoting equality and human development, championing good governance, and embracing diversity? We're now in countdown mode, and I'm getting calls and emails from people across the country that don't want to see Canada's world end. When I set the three-year time frame, I don't think I was preparing for this moment. Clearly, the Canada's world process has had an impact on people, on the way we talk about global issues and how we feel as Canadians. When we started it, I'd hoped that we would plant a seed that probably wouldn't bear fruit for 30 years. But I'm already starting to see the sprouts emerge. Canada's world is a great first step because the first step towards people sort of changing foreign policy is people believing that they can. To come into a foreign policy dialogue group um, as a young woman and be able to take on significant amounts of responsibilities really showed me that it is possible to bring about a change in the way that we think about politics, especially in Canada. As someone who wishes and continues to wish that Canada had a bigger role in the current world, it was sort of hopeful for me to see the way that we can still arouse passion and that we aren't as apathetic as I thought we were. Je crois que la leçon de ce processus, c'est qu'on peut poser des questions complexes aux citoyens lambda et il sera capable d'arriver avec des réponses aussi complexes, aussi riches et aussi surprenantes peut-être que certains politiciens euh, Ces politiciens n'arriveront jamais à la hauteur de, de cette richesse et de cette complexité-là. Un process like Canada's World that intentionally is reaching out to these non-traditional uh, groups. It's often as valuable, if not more valuable, than what the experts bring to the table because it's fresh and it doesn't come from a particular point of view that might have been predicted in advance. So there's going to be impact a year, two years, maybe 10 years from now, 100 years from now. But there's already been a huge impact. And what it's been is that demonstration that people do genuinely care about democratic process, that they have, may have not participated up until this point to the extent that they've wanted to because those opportunities have not been available. We've certainly produced something very effective here and a process that people want to be involved in. The fact that you were able to engage the number of people who got engaged in the Canada's World process suggests to me that that is one of its key strengths, that it, it is an engagement tool that can work and probably should be replicated on a whole number of different policy issues, not just limited to, to Canada's foreign policy. We're used to the government setting up, you know, a royal commission on this, that, and the other thing when it thinks it's got a big problem. And here's a case where the citizens got together found resources which uh, was self-organizing, it was networking rather than the hierarchy and everybody giving orders or taking orders and so on. It was very interactive. It got a lot of uh, people engaged, thoughtfully engaged, that is, that is quite unusual. And so it, it's kind of like the People's Royal Commission on Canada's place in the world. I think it's unprecedented in this country. Je pense qu'on leur a rendu un service en rappelant à tout le monde que la citoyenneté, c'est en fait quelque chose que l'on ne fait pas seulement aux élections, c'est quelque chose que l'on fait en participant au débat, en donnant son opinion, en s'impliquant dans des activités comme celle-ci, qui sont des activités complètement gratuites, pour lesquelles on n'a pas de rémunération. Et qu'en fait, la rémunération importante, c'est celle qui vient après, lorsque l'on voit que notre gouvernement nous écoute et développe des politiques qui répondent à nos intérêts et à nos engagements éthiques et moraux. There was a real empowerment function for me, opening up uh, both the NGO world and the government world to kind of listen more to citizens' voices and take those voices into account. I would like to think that when someone is appointed foreign affairs minister for the first time and he or she is told by the department we have, you know, briefing books for you to read, it would be nice to think of a foreign affairs minister saying, you know what, before the briefing books, I'm going to go out to high schools, college campuses, and I want to ask the people for whom we are all working, who are going to inherit this country, what do they think? What are their views? I'd like to get their views first before I get the briefing books and all that stuff. That would be a good thing, and that's what I think this process has been so instrumental in achieving.
March 3rd, 2010. The Olympics are over and like most Canadians, I don't know what hit me. Something happened in the city. For two weeks we found our voice as Canadians. We showed up and we celebrated. Three years ago I wrote that I was on a mission of rediscovery. A mission to find the heartbeat of this country and amplify its reach beyond our borders. But these last three years have showed me that the heartbeat of this country is healthy and strong. It's just that the devices we use to hear it aren't functioning. Clearly, Canadians are passionate and smart about global issues. They want this country to lead by example and be forward-thinking, confident, and fair in carving out a space for Canada on the global stage. Canada's world, this amazing experiment in democratic development, was the first step in shaping a space for citizens to put forward their ideas on how to put Canada back on the map. And now comes the next step, to ensure that our country rises to this challenge and assures the international community that the world does matter to Canada and that Canada in turn matters to the world. Mm-hmm.